Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, TSMO Performance Management Program Plan Development, Oregon Department of Transportation. My name is Zach Pleasant, and I'll be Zach helping you today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by Federal Highway Administration and hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, also known as NOCO. As a quick reminder, if you don't know already, at NOCO, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation, systems management, and operations community. On the upper right-hand side of your screen, you can see a box called Useful Links. You can browse through those links for TSMO resources and news. Previous webinar recordings related to this topic can also be accessed from there. Now I'll cover a few logistics for today's webinar. We are recording this webinar and the recording will be available through the on-demand learning section of our website. All the attendees are in listen-only mode by default, but we'd like you to stay engaged by using the question discussion pod for comments and questions. We have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so if you have any questions, we encourage all of you to enter them in the questions pod as they come to your mind at any time. The questions will be read aloud one at a time by the moderator, and our presenters will answer each question. That's all I have. So with that, I'll hand it over to our moderator, Daniel Great, to start us off. All right, thanks, Zach. Zach, can you hear me? Here you go, right ahead. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the um, TISMO <clears throat> Performance Plan Man performance management plan webinar um, that is going to focus on an overview of uh, Oregon's, Oregon DOT's plan. And um, we're glad that you took time out of your busy schedule to visit with us today to be a part of this webinar. Just to give some background uh, on where, how this all started and how we ended up here, about four years ago in 2017, I was a part of the Oregon CMM reassessment. And during the discussion there, this plan came up as a part of the discussion. Uh, and it piqued my interest because at that time, uh, a lot of agencies, primarily DOTs, were developing TISMO program plans. Um, and Oregon was developing one of those as well. Well, this particular plan was relatively brand new and I don't think the ink had dried on it just yet. It may have only been a few weeks uh, to maybe a month old. And being that TISMO has somewhat of a technology and institutional element to, the, to it, um, the institutional part is the part that is most challenging in that it takes time. Because when we talk about TISMO uh, and being a, and shifting the transportation culture to one that is more operation-centric, it takes time. So it always resonated with me to reach back out to Oregon to see where they were in terms of uh, the plan, the, the performance management plan, to see you know how things were going. Uh, last year, I attempted to do that, but due to uh, a global distraction that we all were a part of, um, things got a little shuffled. And so I really didn't get a chance to speak with Galen from Oregon DOT until early this year, and it turned out to be pretty timely because what I found out is that they were updating the, the plan at that time from 2017, and um, after having a discussion with with Galen, you know, I threw out there to have him potentially partner with us to um, have a webinar, you know, to bring it out to the masses so that folks can um, be a part of the dialogue, I guess as it pertains to performance management. Um, when, you, when we talk about TISMO uh, performance management and you know, developing a plan for it, there's several things that that plan can do for you. But there's two things that kind of stand out to me, and this is purely my opinion, and that is that the plan provides a means to uh, point to where you should place your investments uh, for those areas that may need improvement. And it also provides a means to tell your operations or your TISMO story. All right, so with that, uh, my name, I'm Daniel Gray, Jr. with the Federal Highway Administration's Resource Center. 
I'm a part of the Operations Technical Service Team, and I'm going to hand it over to the folks at Oregon to do some self-introductions, and then Galen will kick us off. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, my name is Galen McGill, System Operations and ITS Manager at the Oregon DOT. Um, so I'm responsible for our statewide TISMO program or, or operations program, as we call it. And I think we'll have each of the speakers introduce themselves as they uh, as they present. So, as Daniel mentioned, uh, it's kind of interesting timing. Uh, you talked about the ink was just drying on the 2017 plan. Well, we are just publishing, actually, as of today, uh, an update to the plan we originally published in 2017, uh, due to the just the amount of progress we made in implementing uh, measures in in the plan from 2017. It was already time to do an update, and we have a a new update we've just put, just posting the website um, today with an update to a plan. I'll talk a little bit about some of those things that have, have uh, updated in the plan. So what we're going to do today, I'm going to give you a quick overview, kind of the genesis of the plan, where it came from, kind of what the content of it is, and then each of the speakers. And in a lot of part of my presentation, I'll talk about one of the chapters in the plan. Uh, each of the speakers will talk about a different aspect of how are you using data to do the things that Daniel mentioned, uh, make data-informed investment decisions, and to manage the program more effectively. So I included, if I'm assuming most of the participants probably are already familiar with the capability maturity model. It came out of the Sharp II effort uh, and the, the self-assessment tool. But just, just in case anybody's not familiar with that, of course, it's a self-assessment tool. Uh, that allows you to self-assess your organization, organization maturity for a TISMA program around these six dimensions, three business dimensions and three technical dimensions. And one of those, you can see, is, is performance measures. And so when we did our original assessment in 2014, um, these were the results. And you can see of those six dimensions, performance measure and organization staffing being some of the lowest ones. So, we knew it was an area to focus on uh, for us in terms of improvement, and that was how out of the the planning process there, implementation planning, and we, we benefited from a Federal Highway Implementation Grant. Uh, one of the things we funded in that implementation effort was the development of, of our uh, performance management plan. So this is a list of some of the other kind of, just to give you a broader overview of some of the implementation action items that we, we, we worked on. Of course, the one we're going to really focus on today is the Operations Performance Measures Plan and Performance Management Plan. Uh, it, it really complements our program plan, which was a separate deliverable um, that we work on for, as part of the maturity process. And I'll talk a little bit more about things like our, our operations program annual report, which is the other part of these performance measures. I think Daniel is right on this. It's very, data is very useful and very important to us in kind of telling the story for the TISMA program uh, with, within, the, within our agency. So a quick overview of the content that is in the plan. So what you'll, you'll find if you open it up, there's an executive summary that kind of uh, outlines the plan purpose, kind of gives an overview of each of the program areas and, and the key performance metrics, core performance metrics in each of those areas. And then there's a separate chapter for each of the, the areas covered in the plan. And it covers within each area kind of what the goals for that area are, where existing, kind of where we're at, the state of maturity, which core measures exist, which ones still need to be developed. There's kind of a, a plan for how to develop those additional measures as well, which is included in the implementation plan. And then I think really a key part of this is the communication plan. So what do we do with this data? You just, you know, once you've gathered it, how do you use it? Who are the key audiences? How are we going to use it? How do we how do we get out in front of folks um, for, for, for use? So the design of the plan is, of course, it exists as a whole plan, but we've designed individual chapters to be able to be used standalone. For example, there's a chapter on traffic incident management. You can pull that out and use that at its, as a standalone document with, with some of our uh, TIM stakeholders. So the plan has seven topic areas. Actually, originally had six. The 2017 plan has uh, mobility and traffic signals were, were combined. But with the progress we've made in developing some of our, more of our, our traffic signal performance metrics program, we've split it out in our update into a seventh category. But it covers these areas of traffic incident management, mobility, which is really uh, system performance uh, measures, 
uh, measures for transportation operations centers, asset management, to, specific to uh, TISMO, but TISMO asset management, um, work management, which is really more of a, a measure, labor measure, it's more for program management, and, and we'll see more about that later, but uh, travel information and, and traffic signals. And I did mention this because I think having the measures is one thing, but how do you use them? Just to give you an idea of how we're, we're using them fairly extensively in measures. So one of those is, as I said, the annual report. One of the key features of the annual report and telling kind of the TISMA story or operations program story within the agency is a lot of these key measures that you'll, you'll see in the report. Place to report on progress, show trends, that sort of thing. But in addition to that, there's you know, numerous other places within the agency, we try to use that, you know, communication has become a key kind of focus area for the program in, in terms of, of uh, using these tools, reporting on key milestones, reporting on performance, that sort of thing, and whether that's, you know, presentation to leadership teams within the agency, it's an annual report, it's a, it's a uh, use with things like our TIM teams, regional TIM teams, or newsletters, other, other types of uh, agency communication outlets. And one of the key pieces is making the data available anyway. So uh, um, we have a self-serve you know, report portal where people can access uh, these these measures and, and run reports for themselves and, and filter them down to the, the areas, geographic or, or topic areas that they're interested in. This is just an example of the report portal. It's in a system called InView. It's an intranet web app uh, that we use and it gives agency staff access to a number of things. One, it gives a view into uh, real-time data in terms of what's going on in our TOCs from a, a TOC perspective. You can see the complete dispatch record of the incident, you see a lot of details about what's going on in the system real-time. It uh, is, a, is a portal where people can do things like self-subscribe uh, to notifications for incidents. So we have a, a, a portal there where, where a ODA employee can sign up to find out specifically about the type of incident. Um, Know, geographic location in the sense that they, they want to know about and can really fine-tune the notifications to exactly what they want to know about when they want to know about it. But in addition to all those kind of other functions, one of the things that's here is a self-serve report portal. It's where we put um, all the reports that we've developed uh, into a, a single portal that and organized topically to, to more or less align with the, the, the report where people can come in and look at the various reports. And that's organized under the core performance metrics reports at the top, and then additional supporting measures or reports are below. Um, most all of our, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the kind of architecture for the data system behind it, but most all the reports are done using uh, the Microsoft Power BI tool. So they have some features, and you'll see some examples as we go through the presentations in terms of what those reports are and the, the kind of ability people have to fine tune and, and customize those reports for the use they're looking for. So that was a quick overview of the performance management plan itself, where it came from, why, why we did it, uh, to try to improve our capabilities there. Um, and now I'm going to talk briefly about uh, one of the topic areas that's in the plan, which is asset management for our, our operations assets, system assets. Uh, so it's one of the chapters from the port. Our priorities with this particular category were to monitor and understand the long-term trends for our TISMO asset condition and to, then to use this data for project selection and investment decision making. So as you can see the, the color coding here will show the, the, the colored boxes are all in place measures. If, if the box is um, um, white, then it's uh, to be developed. In this case, all these, all these performance measures have been developed, they're in use. Interesting thing about this is this is all data, with one exception, this is all data that we already had available. It's already been gathered. So there's no new data processes that were developed as part of this. It was really a matter of making the data available. They were, it was all embedded in various agency systems, and so we pulled it together to be able to use from a program perspective. So how do we do that? Part of that is the, the we're able to leverage an agency tool, the agency uh, business intelligence data warehouse infrastructure that the agency stood up for a, a number of different uses. Uh, we've integrated data from almost all of our uh, TISMO ITS operations systems into the agency data warehouse, uh, which uh, lets you do some you know, processing formatted data and, and, and then do reporting with things like the Power BI uh, report tool. 
But anyway, the other advantage of having there with these other data sources, it gives us a chance to, to link up some of our system data with other agency data sources, such as our, our financial system or, or some of the project systems, some of those, those sorts of things. So it gives you ability to do even broader kind of data reporting um, and data collaboration type, type reports. So I'll just go through quickly some of the, the, the key measures we have here. And once again, this was kind of using the data we already had and, and say, well, what can this data tell us? So this is data from our, maintenance, our APS maintenance management system. It included install dates and that sort of thing. And so uh, long term, we'd like to transition to a condition rating methodology for the, the short term. What we did to kind of tell our story is, is just use the install dates that was already in our asset inventory that was necessary for our maintenance management system and use it to model it when, when will ITS assets reach into design life. So it's using an assumed end of life, for example, variable message signs, we have a 20-year a lifespan on them. You know, so it's not absolutely perfect in terms of forecasting when stuff's going to wear out, but it gives you an indicator when something's nearing its end of life, and, and, and from there you can kind of determine when investment is necessary. The other thing about how DOTs work, I mean, we're currently working on project scoping for 24 to 27 STIP. So we're looking at forecasting planning projects years in advance. And so when you look at things like a bare bump message sign, we're in 2021 today, and then we're going to obligate all of our funding out to 2027, you kind of have to be looking ahead and see where things are going to be at in that time horizon. So this report looks at just based on install date, uh, forecasting when assets are going to reach end of life. And then there's a map component to the report that's color coded, kind of shows uh, if the dot's solid red, it means it's already beyond its life. If it's uh, half red, half gray, it will go beyond design life in this time horizon of the, of the report. A parallel report we use to help kind of assess condition of our ITS assets is, once again, this is data that comes out of our maintenance management system. So these are labor hours per asset. And so what you're seeing here over the two-year period, 2019 to 2020, you're looking at just variable message sign data. And uh, you can see the top site there is a, a site just east of, of Salem where it had two work orders, total of 91 hours. And then the average hours by region column is showing you what the average um, asset, and I should explain regions. ODOT uses regions the way some states use districts. We have five regions and uh, then 14 districts in the state, but this is a report is organized by regions. Region 2 is Northwest Oregon. Uh, it's showing uh, the average variable missile sign in, in uh, Northwest Oregon over that time period took about 19 hours of labor for maintenance over that time period, and this particular site used 91 hours of labor. Um, you go down the, the bottom line on the chart is showing, for example, Region 1 is our Portland metro region. Um, They've got a lot newer infrastructure, and you can see that with average hours, um, slightly under seven hours average maintenance over a two-year time period per, per sign. And, but we have this one site there that has taken uh, six work orders, uh, 70, almost 75 hours of labor. So it's one way of highlighting um, problem sites that we're putting a lot of maintenance effort into that might benefit from some reinvestment. Uh, sign, sign data, this one, once again, this was kept in a, sign, a separate system, the sign asset management system, but they got a data about retroflectivity, so we already had that data, just getting it in a, a way you could look at it, and it's showing the percentage of signs by ODOT district, uh, breaking down into our 14 districts about what percentage of signs are in a failed state from a retroflectivity perspective. Uh, tra this is a uh, data for our major traffic structures. These are um, sign bridges or large cantilever structures. Uh, they're part of our bridge inventory. So this data was actually in our bridge uh, data system uh, because these structures are large enough, they're actually inspected by our bridge inspectors. So the condition rating existed, just nobody had really been looking at it. So we were able to pull that data out and highlight, uh, you know, the, the data is rated, the, the condition is rated for both for substructure as well as for superstructure. And you take a look at the data and you can see on a map basis, you know, where we have the poor, fair rated um, major traffic structures. Perhaps our most mature, I guess, asset management measure is our traffic signal um, measure. It's the one area where we actually did some additional development work to develop a, a condition rating methodology. 
So as part of our annual inspection process, we are rating the condition of signals and, and um, it gets a rating score and gets categorized into this very poor, poor, fair, uh, good or, or very good condition rating. It kind of is modeled after kind of the way our, our uh, bridge or bridge or pavement kind of condition models exist. So it's very, when you're communicating to audiences, it's used to seeing those numbers because they're much more mature asset systems. We can convey those numbers in, in, a, in a similar similar way. So once again, map based uh, with Power BI reports, you can zoom into the geographic area you're interested in. You can filter down, look at only the very poor locations, do the kind of filtering that the end user might want to do to make the report useful to them. So a quick overview of what we're doing with asset management and in the plan itself, I'm going to turn it over to Justin Guinan. Our next speaker is going to talk some about our data use for traffic incident management. As the next presentation come up, uh, comes up, I wanted to remind folks that if you have any questions, by all means, please put those questions inside of the chat pod. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Guinan. And I'm going to be talking about our traffic incident management data and how we utilize that with our partner agencies today. Um, I am the statewide traffic incident management program coordinator. So I attend a lot of our TIM teams across the state to ensure that our stakeholders have the information um, that we collect and that we can then give out to them. A lot of this information is passed through these TIM teams. These TIM teams are held regionally and are consistent of all of our multidiscipline partners, so TOW, FIRE, EMS, law enforcement, and DOT. We use these performance measures to allow them to see an insight into what our data is and allow them to better uh, adjust schedules, um, patrol areas. Um, they can know where their hotspots are, their high impact areas. Um, we also use this for the areas uh, that have large events, so in our Salem Portland are large metro areas that have maybe a county, state fair, um, large event that they might host. They can use these dashboards to have historic data to allow them to adjust their uh, response, staffing, and other, other uh, key information pieces that would allow them to manage these incidents and events a lot better. As far as performance measures specifically go, our main one that we use, and this is actually an external report that we have posted to an external site, would be our TIM team report. As you can see, this is just a snapshot of page three of six. Uh, the, this is the primary one that we use with our partner agencies, and we can break this down by attribute type. We can go by ODOT district, uh, county, year, quarter, route, mile point range within that route. And then we also added recently fire agency that allows us to put up a GIS border around a fire agency. Uh, one of the things that we run into with that is that is uh, as reported. So if there are some, some small discrepancies or between dispatch centers and stuff like that, sometimes we do have some discrepancies in the data, but it does give a pretty good historic picture of what ODOT is doing. Uh, because this is based off of our dispatch information, it's basically what ODOT is doing as far as crashes, disabled motorist debris within that fire district's geographical boundary. As you can see, we also show their top five hotspots according to their, again, district, county, or year, or quarter, or all. Um, we can set our own parameters and filters, and then we can see our incident count by weekday and our incident count by hour, which is key for like our law enforcement partners um, that have patrol zones or schedules. We also use it for our dedicated incident response staff or safety service patrol, as some other states refer to it. Uh, this allows them when they're going to winter, spring, fall hours and making schedule adjustments, they can utilize this to know when their uh, most efficient day by hour would be to have um, staffing increase or decrease and adjust their time. Another piece that we use internally, this is an internal only, is our incident response dashboard. Um, this is really for our dedicated incident response and non-dedicated incident response staff to be able to see um, number of calls yesterday, month to day, clearance, key performance measure month to day, so our 90 minute clearance goals. So we'll show our over 90 minutes um, for year to date, month to date. And then we also have our median closure durations, and these would fluctuate every day. Um, this is updated. 
And this allows our dedicated incident response app to see almost in real time uh, their performance as a crew and allows them to adjust accordingly. This, with the other dashboard I showed you previously, enables them to make staffing adjustments or operational adjustments to meet the performance measure needs or legislatively mandated key performance measures that we, we need to try to maintain. Another piece that we use in Oregon is our push-pull drag. Um, it's, a, it's a program that we use to clear lanes faster um, under our 90-minute goal. Uh, we have some subtypes that we track this on, and this is lane blocking, right? So when we go to push-pull drag, this will track when we, when we click the box in our TSCS or our dispatch system. This allows us to track uh, percentages of times it was used by region, by year. Um, we can also drill down to each individual district within a region and see by year um, the percentage of events that use push pull drag. In slides two and three of this dashboard, we can see down to radio number to see how often that specific operator is using push pull drag. Um, and it enables us to really say, you know, is this an effective training? Are we utilizing it appropriately? Um, do we have an increase or decrease? Uh, is it used when we want them to be using it? Is it not being used when we want them to use it? And it really helps the districts and the regions identify um, some more performance measures that maybe maybe they can use specifically in their area to to increase or decrease their response or their on scene time by using push pull drag. Another one that's fairly new to ODOT is our struck by data. Our struck by data is recorded basically once a year from our OSHA partners. Our the current consumer business services. And this this is still needs some work. We're still cleaning a lot of this up. But what this boils down to is how many struck by events do we have that they get reported to them. And what we're able to do with some work um, for our data folks and working with DCBS, the hardest part was identifying occupation. And we wanted to make sure that our occupations that we were tracking were ones that we were worried about, right? If you pull data from DCBS, your occupation list can be fairly long. And so what we ended up doing was an agreement to say what occupations we were worried about as far as Kim goes as a strategy, right? And then this breaks it down by year and type and also events by most frequent event type. And this breaks it down by source of injury. So some of these are a little confusing. It can be, you know, pedestrian struck while standing in roadway bypassing vehicle or parked vehicle, right? So some of these seem kind of repetitive, but there are fine little differences between each different event um, that enables them to, to filter this out. So our next steps as a program, we want to ensure that we continue to update our strategic plan. That's where a lot of these performance measures, um, between the TISMO performance measures plan, our strategic plan, this is where we source a lot of our information. And then we want to make sure that our data performance measures keep up with our strategic plan and our TISMO plan. Um, TIM training, obviously, if we continue to push the TIM training and we continue to um, get the data performance measures and all this information out, then we, we obviously can, can increase these relationships. We can increase the data. Uh, part of our hope is that if we continue to provide this data, that we continue to get data fed into us, right? Currently, we have, to have, we have to go seek a lot of this data from our partner agencies, and hopefully in the future, we'll have this available to us and it'll be automated. Um, so some of our other strengths is our stakeholder communication. Um, we do pride ourselves um, a lot on our communications, right? So we have newsletters, like Gavin was talking about. We have internal communications, external communications. But one of our biggest communication strategies that we have is our TIM team. And that kind of ties into our partnerships as well. If we if we go through and we we build these communications and we build these partnerships, our data sets are stronger and our buy-in is stronger. So we over the past several years, we've seen a large increase in the usage of this data. And once we started publishing on an external site and sharing that link with a lot of folks, we see we saw a large increase in the people that were using the data. So we know that for us that we need to continue that TIM dashboard, we need to continue to update that data, and we need to make sure that it's clean and easy for our partners to use. So our opportunities, um, we obviously can always increase our TIM teams. We plan on adding several last year, um, but due to COVID, a lot of our teams stopped meeting, and we're hoping to re-ramp that up this year. 
Um, tracking secondary caches is obviously another opportunity that we're working on. Um, and then we're also working on some abandoned vehicle stuff and refining our struck by data. Uh, but our top two priorities are tracking secondary crashes and, and TIM team increase, and that's specific to the TIM program. Strategic plan, this just identifies some of our sections. So, you know, our push pull drag program, TIM team development, tracks responder struck by fatalities, and unified TIM training academy. So you can see where our performance measures tie directly into our strategic plan, and this is how we how we identify what we really want to, to ensure that we're covering with our partner agencies. Unified Tim Training Academies um, is, is a goal of ours, and when we go do these uh, Tim Trainings at Academy, it's an opportunity for us to share this data, it's an opportunity for us to provide this information to them um, to try to get more investment from our partners. So that's all I have on the Tim data. Um, I'll answer the questions in the chat box here in a minute, and then I'll go ahead and pass it on to Chief. Hey, Justin, if you wanted to give yourself a break, you can actually wait until then so that um, just in case uh, folks, you know, had wanted to add on to the uh, question. Again, I wanted to encourage all right. folks, so if you have a question, by all means, put it into the chat box. Sorry, Chi. Good afternoon. My name is Chi Mai, and I am a transportation system analysis engineer with Oregon DOT. I have spent the last um, 24 years of my career analyzing traffic and finding improvement solutions on the state system for the Portland metro region. My um, presentation today is on monitoring system performance and data-driven investment decisions. And just to give um, people context in case you're not familiar with Oregon, um, Portland Metro Region, which is um, Region 1 uh, in Oregon, is the most urban area. The rest of the state is far less urban and um, experience little to no congestion. So my presentation will um, mainly focus on my work for the Portland Metro. So prior to 2012, our system performance was monitored in piecemeal at corridor and sub-corridor level through studies or project development. But since 2012, um, we've supplemented our existing in-house data with investment in commercial probe data. Um, we also um, looked onto the federal localized bottleneck reduction program and the combination of the two um, prompted us to monitor traffic performance on all of Portland Metro freeways. And um, so this is not meant for you to uh, be able to read the text, but just to give you some context. Uh, when we started, we uh, produced these type of um, information fact sheet for internal technical staff, and it's mainly the, um, the page on the left is to highlight where all the bottleneck locations are, and then on the right is basically our um, sort of um, it prioritize um, uh, the locations and where we need to invest. And with the sort of the usefulness of monitoring the data and being able to inform projects and programs, we decided to advance that work to producing our what we currently call a traffic performance report. And we produce these every two years. And within each report, um, um, we have a comparison of year-to-year -year, uh, data. We, um, we, it's very extensive. We cover the corridors, and then we also bring it up to at the regional high level. And the reports are tailored uh, beyond just the technical staff. It's meant to um, inform the general audience. We uh, wanted management to be able to use it, or public information officers, anyone that works on a project 
or grant application or needs to um, respond to the public um, and the public uh, also read this, has access to this. Um, it's a very useful document that speaks to the performance of our system. And so the purpose is to monitor the freeway system performance over time, inform the freeway system management, support prioritized projects, project implementation analysis, which is before and after analysis. And we have um, many uh, performance metrics, but we wrap it all up at these uh, main points, which are congestion, reliability, safety, and um, impact to freight. And so this, um, I won't go into the, um, the many pages, and so I just wanted to bring up at the high level, this um, shows the extent of the bottlenecks. If someone just wants to see where are these bottlenecks located, this one page show you where they are. And then I get asked quite a bit, which are the top recurring bottlenecks in our region? And so we create um, very easy to uh, understand graphics, which speaks to the location, the duration, and the length of the queue. And then as far as reliability, we um, mainly wanted to track um, the system um, where we have um, unreliability and um, um, where it's breaking down. So traditionally, PM is where it's most unreliable, followed by AM. But we also, uh, with the mindset of keeping freight in mind, we wanted to track the midday and highlighting where it's degrading the most and when uh, locations that are um, when midday is more unreliable than even a.m. or p.m. And then we also wanted to highlight crashes and incident hotspots. And basically, we um, track it in the same way with congestion. Um, where are these locations? Where are they growing in terms of the duration during the day? Um, and the extent of it on the system. And uh, we link this also to, also in the report, we have uh, a page on the incident um, management program. And we feel that the data support that program and why we need to continue to support that and invest in that program. And we lay out the safety and the congestion hotspots together that's where we can prioritize and uh, devote um, our effort into finding solutions. And then we also tie everything up with the daily cost of uh, congestion. And um, if we continue to not invest, uh, how much is it costing us and, um, and how it's growing each year. And then we also have, um, we highlight the projects that we currently have uh, in the works. And, um, and this is meant to, the data is meant to help support these projects. And these projects is, are meant to help um, with future um, performance on the system that are going to improve the system. Um, Let's see, I think um, just to mention um, in the report, which I didn't show here, we also highlight uh, some of our other programs that are meant to help um, uh, with the uh, improving the condition. So we're now studying tolling onto a system. So we highlight that. We also highlight some of the incident, um, the natural disasters that's been um, occurring in our um, region. And so that really helps give the context when people also see the data and the performance. 
And to give you an example, all of the projects that we start, or if you're doing a grant application, everybody starts with looking at the traffic performance report for that reference. And just an example of uh, a couple projects that rely on such data. Uh, the first is the corridor bottleneck operation study. We call it CBOS uh, for short. So this um, was originally cre um, completed in 2013. It was a response to the federal localized bottleneck reduction program. It was focused on freeways. We initially identified 36 recurring bottlenecks and 21 op uh, project opportunities. And out of those opportunities, we used the, um, the system performance to prioritize the projects and um, most of these, um, those prioritized projects have been built and have been very uh, successful in our region. And so right now, we are currently uh, working on CBOS 2. And the current effort looks at the next batch of problem areas and potential solutions. Um, this is really the old, um, the, when we worked on the original CBOS, uh, it's not meant for you, again, to be able to read the text, but just to kind of let you know that we, for each um, uh, corridor area, we identify where the bottlenecks are and then be able to identify the solutions to match with that. And then with the completion of the, uh, the CBOS, the original one, we transitioned to the data which is so great uh, being able to look at the um, region-wide level and identifying uh, problem areas. So we decided to transition to our next uh, project, which is the um, Active Traffic Management Atlas. And this is sort of the master plan for all of our um, in Portland region. And so again, we use the, the, uh, the same data uh, congestion and the safety identification, and we were able to identify the appropriate uh, active traffic management um, solutions to tailor fit the, uh, the problem areas. And then um, with the completion of um, many of our CBOS um, projects, we had enough time, so we did before and after analysis, and I'm just uh, presenting one before and after analysis to give you a demonstration. This is a I-5 southbound auxiliary lane, and it's a system-to-system -system connectivity between Oregon 217 southbound to I-205 northbound. And just to give you context, um, everybody that's entering um, from Oregon 217, 60% um, of them exit at the um, four downstream exit. And then everybody leaving I-205, 90% of them um, came from um, the four um, upstream on-ramp. So it, for the CBOS, the um, off-plane is the natural solution because it allows um, the weaving to be contained within, uh, or reduce the weaving and not be impacting the through um, uh, lane. And so with that, we did this uh, before and after, the initial uh, before and after analysis. And um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the orange uh, area line is the project area. And we were able to see that the hours of congestion was reduced from five hours down to one. And then in the blue line that's um, to the north of that is uh, the upstream section. And we were able to reduce the hours of congestion from 2.75 hours down to zero. And then the green is on Oregon 217, also upstream of the project section uh, on our adjacent facility that reduced the hours from four hours of congestion down to zero. And tying it up with the delay reduction savings is about $8 million annually. And so something like this um, gets wrapped up 
also in the next edition of the report that we produce. And so um, this is my last slide, but I think with um, everything I presented uh, on our um, program to monitor the system performance, it's a full cycle for us. We start with identifying the problem locations, and then from there it helps to support our work and uh, finding the solutions and prioritizing the locations um, where we can um, implement the project. And then we find the funding and we construct it, and then we come back in full circle to analyze the before and after um, impact of that, traf um, that project. And I think that, at the end of the day, influences our future investment. And when I say investment, um, it's many fold. It's the investment in projects or programs to improve the system. But then it's also investment into the, the program that we're doing to monitor the, um, the system and then the data that we continually need to invest so that we can um, produce um, more accurate and uh, helpful information to support projects. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Brent Atkinson. I'm with System Operations and ITF, and I am the Traveler Information and Performance Measures Coordinator. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes today and talk about the uh, Transportation Operations Centers, a little bit about Traveler Information, um, some about work management, but um, I also wanted to tie together you know, some of the, the data and the communication with the operation uh, performance measures plan. So here is a very, very busy poster. And um, as we've probably said a bunch of times, really this isn't necessarily designed for you to, to read and comprehend every little nuance and detail. But what this is telling us is the uh, our regional transportation operations centers are our information collection uh, portions of the agency. So this shows kind of the workflow of all the information in and the information out um, for each of the TOCs. And it, it goes, uh, you know, kind of a CAD to CAD type of system where we're able to communicate electronically with dispatch centers for police and fire agencies and Oregon State Police. It ties into our incident responders, our safety patrols out on the freeways, and uh, working with maintenance and road and weather reports, and also all of the technology um, with the uh, dynamic, dynamic messaging, variable advisory speeds, variable speed limits, all of that technology that's out there trying to work with the uh, the improvement for the operation. So this is a, a look at the dispatch software that we use, the at least the interface for it. Uh, we call this TOX. Uh, so TOCS is, is similar to CAD, but we've designed this in-house to be very specific to the needs of our agents. And it's a uh, major contributor to the data that we collect. So as I was saying, the information comes into the dispatch centers. And um, all of these events that are on the left side of the screen um, are an overview of a specific area within the state. And then on the right side is more specifically, it, it is a specific event. And you'll notice um, in that event management screen that we've got tons of information going in there. Um, everything from you know what is it, where is it, how is it impacting the highway and the lane, who's out there with it. Um, but down at the bottom left is where this information really transforms itself 
akin to the data that we can use to uh, really talk about what's going on. You'll see that we have these event attributes in there, and there's a whole bunch of different tabs of, of these attributes. And as the information comes in, the dispatchers are selecting the appropriate ones, which all ends up in our, our database to allow us to really work with the information that we're getting in. This gives us wonderful opportunity to use this, this information, this data, and highlight a lot of the accomplishments and the things that we're doing. Um, you'll see that the top left is kind of the area of responsibility for each of the four TOCs. Um, Portland Metro is, the, is a very small, concentrated area. Then we have our Northwest uh, Operations Center, our Southern Transportation Operations Center, and the blue is a uh, far more rural part of our state um, handled by one, it's a large geographic area handled by one um, Transportation Operations Center, our, our central center. So we're, we're using this information that all, that's all being collected, and these uh, graphics are all part of our annual report. Um, the bottom left, is the median time span from incident creation to VMS activation. So it's telling the story about um, you know, how long does it take once we understand that an event has happened on the system for us to start getting information out on the roadway to the, to the public. And then on the right is uh, how long it takes us from event creation to posting travel information through our ATIS system. Uh, these are all performance metrics that are, are part of the overall plan. Galen introduced this a little bit earlier. Um, many of our performance measures reports are available to our, our stakeholders uh, internally at a centralized location in our InView system. And this particular page um, is for the transportation operations centers. And they're roughly in line with how the operations plan is laid out. Um, it outlines the core performance measures, but as, as Galen noted, it also has the supplemental or support reports that go along with that. Justin earlier mentioned the, uh, or the TIM dashboard. And this is a very, very similar dashboard, except it's more specifically aligned to how the TOCs are operating. So the, the previous slide gave us kind of a very high level, like a 50,000 foot view of some of the things that we're reporting on. And that audience is you know, for a non-technical audience at a statewide you know, agency level. This gets more into the operation um, and it's made more specifically uh, for the operators and the operations managers to take a look and see what's happened you know, yesterday, um, month to date. And you'll, you'll note that we have things like uh, the average action count. So how many actions does it take an operator to create and work it their way through an event? Just on average. These are all average numbers. Um, how many people are taking a look at, at TripCheck, our website for travel information? Um, you know, just all kinds of different performance metrics. Just to give, again, kind of a 40,000-foot view of everything that's going on. When we dive deeper using the same data, um, I mentioned the average action count that we showed. Um, on the dashboard just kind of a, as a snapshot, but we also trend the same information. So this trend is, is showing us that the average action count is going up pretty pretty regularly year over year for the for each of the centers with you know one one exception there. So what does that mean and, and how do we use that information?
well, one of the things that we can look at, again, you know, we're, we're now probably at a 20,000 foot level um, looking at this data. Um, if, you, if you were to look at this, this is specific to our RPS system. So this is our response planning system that helps us plan and activate variable message science out on the freeway. Um, responding to crashes and other events. So one thing that we can start taking a look at is where are the TOCs making changes to the plan? And um, we could kind of take a look at that and after you know time passes and enough data comes in, we can we can see some trends and maybe where we need to make some corrections adjustments to the planning system so that the TOCs can reduce the workload that they have in implementing the time plan. And again, this goes back to the event count or the, the average actions that, that the dispatcher has to take getting through each of these events. So we're counting each of these transactions. And if we can operationally reduce those, we can make it far more efficient for, for the operator to get their way through an event. So this is taking a look at the traveler information side. Um, of course, the traveler information is tied very, very closely to what the dispatchers are doing because the dispatchers are sending out all of the traveler information. Um, so they're separate measures within the operations plan, but they're tied very closely together. Um, this goes through, you know, visitors to the information outlets, um, and then how are we doing, are, are, are we missing the beat in sending out the information? Um, and then we have a specific measure. During wintertime, we send out road and weather reports, which includes chain conditions. And we want to make sure that that information is timely, uh, going out regularly at Time. So we have a, a core pressure, sorry, core performance measure report that addresses that specifically. Tied in closely with travel information, we have a system which we call TripCheck Local Entry. Um, it's a secure web-based portal that allows cities and counties and some other agencies to enter travel information from the local level. Um, into our travel information system. And this report is just a kind of a high-level look at the number of users, the number of events, and the different things that are going on in TripCheck local entry. Um, started this a couple of years ago, and you can see that we've got you know 41 organizations and 111 different users. Um, the trend line over on the top right where it spikes um, that was a very, very heavy use period. It was a real big anomaly. Um, then it, that's directly related to some major wildfires we had in the urban interface areas, uh, several places around the state. And uh, TripCheck local entry went uh, kind of bonkers with local agencies entering fire evacuation information um, and road closure information on the local level. Um, helps us you know, again, at the operations at the statewide level, kind of tell the story about the success of the investment in TripCheck local entry and the use and the information that we're getting out of that into the hands of, of the travelers and the evacuees. Galen also mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, our data warehouse has the ability to for us to join data together. This specific report, we're starting to get down, you know, into the 10,000 foot level now, really pretty detailed information. This report um, is seven pages, and we're joining event data together with road and weather data to show the relationship between weather and closures and crashes. Uh, we're using this type of, of information for planning purposes and just to see how, how badly uh, storms can impact the operation system or the operation of the freeway system.
working through into the work management uh, area again. We have our core performance measures, and in this case, we're measuring a couple of different things for a couple of different units. Um, we're measuring with the ITS, the top group, the field applications for um, repairs and maintenance, and then um, the middle part, the CSMT part, is actually looking at our software uh, supporting maintenance folks and their workload and trying to keep all of these systems up and running. And again, this dives down, you know, relatively deep, um, you know, close view of what's going on on the system. This is uh, giving us our work orders, um, and this this gives us location. So who's busy, where are they busy, when are they busy, um, and how many hours is it taking them to get through the work that's going on. And this next slide, also part of the same report, um, is similar information, but it's focused on the type of asset. So what assets are giving us the most work? And is that related to age or all those questions start being uh, explored through the use of this information. And it's always good to see downtrend for like the hours of work. So all in, in, in the end, all of this ties up. Um, the data we collect and analyze and report on helps our program tell our story. It helps us support the work that uh, that we do and the improvements that we've made, the, the information which turns into data, you know, helps us make decisions on investments, uh, maintenance of our assets, and uh, the prioritization of our of our uh, resources. And uh, it's fun to watch all of this come together into our annual report, which really. Um, uses this data and really tells the story. Thank you very much for your time, and I think uh, we can toss this back to Daniel. All right, thanks, Brent. Uh, so now we're going to uh, pull up the, the uh, chat pod to go through the uh, questions that are in there. And let's see. Uh, the first one is actually a question from myself. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'll leave it up to you guys to arm wrestle, answer, um, or address these. Um, the first one is how heavy of a lift um, was it to get buy-in throughout the agencies Throughout the, the throughout the agency during the time you were developing the plan. Uh, Daniel, this is Gail, and I think I'll I'll take that one. I'm probably the only one that was around for that original report uh, development. Um, it wasn't too tough. I, I'll tell you for a couple reasons. One, I think the whole CMM process encouraged that kind of consensus building and. And there was pretty broad consensus that we weren't doing what we could do with our data. And I think the other reason it wasn't such a tough lift is because most of the data existed. We just weren't using it. So as a matter of, it wasn't a big, a big effort to go out and gather data or to, to do anything. There was a lot of work to do in terms of developing um, the data infrastructure and reporting, um, you know, reports. But but there wasn't a lot needed where people had to go change work processes and some of those changes are a lot harder to do. So that, that part was relatively easy. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we had a Federal Highway Implementation Grant, so there was actually funding to, to work on the plan, so that, that helped as, as well. Probably the biggest change that I had in terms of getting the plan done, and it was more on the implementation of the plan side of things, is I did do a little bit of um, reorganization on our team to actually create a data analyst position, we didn't really have a have a uh, position with those kinds of skill sets. So 
part of what was necessary to really move forward on the implementation side was was get somebody in with those kind of um, technical data data skills to really work on the report development and that sort of thing. So that was kind of our journey. So, but it wasn't wasn't really too difficult to get the buy-in because it was uh, very. I think people saw that as a weakness. They saw we had room to improve, and they saw it as a priority to to move forward as one of the earlier actions we took on the, the CMM implementation um, roadmap that we had. Okay, thanks, Galen. And I think you may have answered this already um, when you talked about the grant. Uh, what was the plan developed completely in-house? Um, it was developed originally with a consultant contract, so the 2017 plan was developed with the consultant support. Um, we did the uh, update that we, we just published internally, except for I had uh, to <laughs> both my data analyst position and uh, the person I had that does our communication work um, and was working on editing and doing the final report update. So both left about the same time, got promotions to other positions. So in order to finish the plan, I hired a consultant to just come in and final, do the final kind of graphics and, and technical editing kind of report. But the update was done primarily um, in-house. In okay. All right, thanks. The, the next question comes from Susan Lane, and her question is, does Oregon DOT see any value in having predetermined detour routes as part of TIM, uh, ones that have been checked to make sure that the over-height trucks will not impact bridges? I'll go ahead and take this one. Um, so it, it really varies by region and district for Oregon DOT. So some of our districts actually have uh, predetermined detour books that they use um, through their maintenance crews and to respond to other various activities. And then other districts, uh, they do not have predetermined route booked, but they may have the Waymaster's phone number after hours call information. So if we have to detour onto a city or county road, um, we have um, a lot of the districts have a process in place for notifying the county or city waymaster or public works to ensure that we're not, you know, going through restricted areas, over height, overweight, bridges, you know, uh, problem intersections and things like that. But we do actually have some areas that do have predetermined routes. And a lot of our fire districts and public works and local law enforcement have also had those conversations with their, their partner agencies. And so when they're on scene, they'll typically advise of the best use of the route. Okay, thanks, Justin. And the, uh, let's see, next I think these were kudos to um, to Chi on the before and after analysis. Um, and that was from Susan Lane as well. Uh, then Williams had a question about the uh, reports look like they were primarily freeways, uh, uh, on freeways, off all freeways, and Chi provided a response to that, saying that uh, freeways were the most straightforward and um, they're open to analyzing non-freeways at a later date. Um, Chief, is there anything else you wanted to add to that statement? Um, well, I just wanted to say that my work um, has been mainly to support the Portland Metro. And after we produce our reports, um, for that region, um, we have a statewide report now that um, also it's not as extensive as ours, but it does report on the performance of the state um, system that's outside of the region one. And, and so we have that, which I didn't um, uh, cover today. Okay. So Daniel, this is Gail. I'll add a little bit to the answer. So I think uh, I'm not sure entirely the the context for Ben's question. So most of the work that she presented there was specific with focus freeways. Most of the other reports we talked about today, you know, all of our TIM measures, um, asset management measures, any of those other the measures we were talking about are all statewide in the sense they're all state state roads. And what we didn't talk about today uh, was our traffic signal metrics. Of course, those are specifically um, focused on signal arterials. So. Um, 
for the most part, our, our measures are pretty broad, but you know, for some of those things like the travel time reliability, some of the congestion related measures, um, while we have the data statewide, most of the analysis has, point, has been focused on the congested areas, urban areas, urban freeways primarily. Okay. Um, I have another question, and it pertains to uh, the visibility of TISMO now at Oregon. Um, because one of the things that a lot of folks struggle with is visit, bringing visibility to TISMO in order to, um, I guess, get budget for get budgets for uh, TISMO activity or strategies to be deployed. Do you think the development of this plan has brought more visibility to TISMO uh, as it pertains to uh, funding? Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I believe so. I think it's been really important. I think Brent's last slide there talked about helping us tell our story. Mm -hmm. That's becoming increasingly important. Um, budgets are obviously getting tighter. The, the needs across the transportation system are, you know, they far outstrip the funding available. So, you know, if you can't tell your story, if you can't tell about the needs in a compelling way, a way that people can understand quickly, I mean, you're going you're gonna to lose in that funding discussion. So I think the ability to have this data, I mean, I, I'm glad we didn't wait any longer to develop it. It's been been pretty key. Most of our other asset programs or, you know, like Pavements Bridge are much more mature in ability to tell their story and what's going on. So it's been really important for us to mature the TISMO program to the point to tell those stories. Now, um, ODOT has a little bit unique budget approach in the sense that we have uh, specific legislatively set budget limitations, and so operations is kind of its own budget limitation. But there's still the trade-off that happens as as those budgets are getting set in terms of how much money goes into a bridge program versus a you know pavement preservation program versus a, you know an operations or TISMO program. And so the data has been really key for us to tell that story. I think increasing. Um, visibility into what's going on in the system, condition of TISMO assets, which are much shorter lived assets than, say, a bridge, um, is, is all being really key to, to being able to be be able to participate in this funding discussion and explain our our uh, funding needs and the impact of funding or or lack of funding in a real way. Now we still have ways to mature. We don't have. We don't yet have the kind of forecast models that say if we invest at this level, what's going to happen to the system, or we, you know, those those sorts of, of things. So there's still so room for improvement. But I, to this point, it's been really really a key step for us in, in telling that that story about the value of the operations program and, and where funding is needed. Okay, thanks, Gildan. Um, I have one last question for for myself anyway. Um, the plan, is it available online uh, for public consumption? Uh, the report? Yes. Yeah, I will post the link um, where you can find the report. I think you can also find the um, um, our annual report and some of those other, like our program plan as well at, at that link. So um, if people are interested, the, the link is there in the uh, the chat box. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to run through my closing remarks. However, the folks that are on, if you have any questions, by all means, we still have about uh, 17 minutes uh, until the end of this. Um, first off, I want to thank uh, you know the folks from ODOT, Galen, Justin, Chi, and Brent. Thank you for taking time out to to uh, come in and provide this overview of your plan. Uh, I think it's very important, this type of plan, as we as we have said several times throughout the presentation, it's important in, in, in terms of telling your operation story. And that's something that uh, we at Federal Highway have, you know, endless discussions about in terms of telling the operation story. Um, I also want to thank Zach and the, uh, the folks at the center for you know the logistics and and, ha and helping uh, putting all this together for us, and I don't want to miss anybody. 
I think that's it. If I missed anybody, blame it on my head and not my heart. Um, but I, I really do appreciate it. I think this type of dialogue needs to happen, and hopefully this will be the one be one of many um, in, in terms of performance uh, plan development. Uh, because as far as I know, you guys are probably the only one to have such a plan. And if anyone in the audience um, knows of any other uh, DOTs that do, uh, please, by all means, uh, put that in the chat pod let us know. But like I said, I think and hope that this will spark a dialogue nationally in terms of um, having, you know, in terms of shifting the culture to one that is more operation-centric, you know, via the use of, of being able to tell us their stories, you know, via a plan such as this one. So with that, I'm going to give you guys back 15 minutes of your day if, you're, if there aren't any other questions or comments. And I will turn it back over to Zach. All right, thanks, Daniel. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. I also want to thank our panelists. Uh, we had some really good information today. Like I mentioned at the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar, along with the, um, yeah, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the NOCO website. On behalf of the National Operations Center of Excellence and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.